Hello once again, and welcome to Taste and See on SSC Live TV. My name is Ken Jobst, and I just want to welcome you once again to the intersection of faith and food. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a, uh, a little-known favorite, popular years ago, but today it's, uh, it's something that harkens back to an earlier time. And as a matter of fact, today we're going to look at the, the topic of temptation and betrayal and how it all gets wrapped together in a little confection that is called Turkish Delight. Now, there may be some fans of that C.S. Lewis series. You, you remember The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? If you've not read it or if you've not seen the, uh, the you know, the, the videos that are out there of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I highly recommend it to you. There's a uh, particular passage in the book in which one of the main characters, whose name is Edmund, right? Edmund Pevensey. And he comes upon the, you know, there, there's a lion, there's a witch, and there's a wardrobe. And it turns out the, the witch is the, the white witch, and it's wintertime and all. And I, I, I have to set this up for you just a little bit. The, uh, the, the white witch has Edmund and is giving Edmund um, basically whatever he wants. Now, spiritually, she's, she's representing evil but she's what we would call a wolf in sheep's clothing. And as it turns out, she asks this question to, to Edmund. First she says, would, would you like something warm to drink? And he, he says, why, yes, yes, please, your, your majesty, because she's, you know, all that, dressed out with a, you know, crown and everything. Well, and so she drops a little drop in, and ba-boom, there's something to drink. And it's a nice hot drink because we're outside and it's in the snow. So Edmund drinks that. He says, oh, that's wonderful. But then, but then, the white witch asks Edmund, what, what would you like to eat? And he says, Turkish delight. Now I've got to fill in some of the blanks here. It's kind of hard to find Turkish delight at a grocery store here in Louisville, Kentucky. But Turkish Delight was a, a remarkable little confection, and we, we've got a, a few of them right here. This is the Turkish Delight that comes from uh, this particular company, comes in a package like this, and these Turkish Delight are pistachio flavored. Traditionally, Turkish Delight was rose water flavored. Now, now here's the thing about Turkish Delight. Back in late Victorian England, everything that was from somewhere else was in style. So the foods that were exotic, foods that had to be imported. And one of the sweets that was available then, right, right around, you know, 1890s, was this concoction called Turkish Delight. Now, once again, it had to be imported because nobody in England could reverse engineer it. They couldn't figure out how it was made. Oh, they tried, but they never got exactly the same consistency, the same flavor, the same texture. It always came out a little differently. Now, in essence, what we have here are some jellies, and these jellies are coated with powdered sugar. And I'm just going to open one of them up for you so you can take a look at it. But it's, to look at, it's, well, it just looks like a little jelly candy that you might find just about anywhere. Right there on the inside, we have the pistachios that are included. And it's a, it, admittedly, it's a very tasty thing. It, it's a, a wonderful flavor. And as it turned out, the English sent people to Turkey to try to learn how to make this candy. And they came back and they wrote big, long books. And some of the books described that you had to have a certain kind of water. And you had to have two people in the kitchen to stir this concoction while it was boiling, while it was cooking, that it was so thick to stir it, the first person would get tired 
before it was ready. And so the second person had to come in and continue stirring this big copper cauldron full of the, the hot bubbly stuff that would become Turkish delight. Then it's poured out of the cauldron. It's cut in three centimeter strips that are later cut into five centimeter pieces covered with, um, basically covered with powdered sugar and then presented in a beautiful eight-sided box. It was always put in an eight-sided box for some reason. Think of early branding, right? Okay, so we've got the Turkish delights, and this was what little Edmund told the white witch he wanted more than anything. He wanted Turkish delights. Now, let me give just a little bit more background here. In this particular story, this takes place in the backdrop of England during World War II. And for children in England during World War II, you know, candy was pretty hard to come by. As a matter of fact, there was rationing for candy in Great Britain from 1942 all the way up to 1953. Candies were rationed in all that time. And so, think, put yourself in little Edmund's situation. Little Edmund is like, hey, here's somebody asking me for whatever I want. And so I'm going to go for, I'm going to go for all the, all the gold. I'm going to ask for Turkish delight. So what happens? The, 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 the white witch presents Edmund with Turkish delight. And by the way, this is the kind of stuff that when you start eating it, it's so chewy and it's so sticky. If you've got dental work that's a little bit questionable, you might want to be very careful about it. But, but it is absolutely delicious. Now, it's, it's not a flavor that a lot of people in America in the 21st century would particularly be drawn to. But it is, it's pistachio, it's rose water, it's uh, perhaps almond flavors, different, different flavors. And by the way, if you want to get the deluxe package, quite often Turkish Delight will be packaged with like four or five or six flavors together. They're available online, right? Now, so as it turns out, Little Edmund gets his Turkish delight and he eats it. And well, that was pretty good. And he's assured that there's more where that came from. And I'm going to cut to the chase here. But before long, little Edmund has ratted out his entire family for the sake of getting more Turkish delight. It was uh, exactly so. So he's handing over his his siblings to the white witch simply in order to get more turkish delight now it's it's a uh, it, it's truly a wonderful story i encourage you you get a chance to read the lion the witch and the wardrobe it's a christian allegory so it's a story which has elements in it that point us to jesus christ and the the lion's name is aslan is is a, a figure of christ but I encourage you to go take a look, read the story. But I'm amazed at C.S. Lewis's complete, uh, utter, total understanding of how we are with respect to temptation. Because as soon as little Edmund gets his hands on what he had so longed for, he just wants more and more and more, and there's nothing he will stop at to get more Turkish delight. In the Bible, in the New Testament, the book of James has some powerful words for us with respect to temptation. Listen to what James says from James chapter 1. This is verses 13 through 16. James writes, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt 
any one. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Now, we're speaking about temptation. And you certainly, the, the words of James ring true to us. That we cannot say that God is the one who's tempting us. God cannot be tempted by evil, and God does not tempt anyone toward evil. But here's how the process of temptation works. We're tempted when we're drawn away by our own desires. Unhealthy desires. Might be desires for fame or fortune or power or one thing or another. And you know what? Everybody has their own custom-built set of temptations. What it is that's tempting to me might not be tempting to you. You know what? Maybe you come along, you take a bite of Turkish delight, and you say, meh. I can take it or leave it. Oh, but wait a minute. What if I had a Snickers bar right here? What about that? Right? We all have our points of temptation. And what James is telling us is that we have to recognize temptation because the process of maturity that temptation takes is it begins simply with a desire. But then that desire entraps us and entices us. And then it, that desire gives birth to the action, gives birth to sin, which gives birth ultimately to death. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness and, and the, the temptations for, for Jesus, you know, climb up on top of the temple and throw yourself down then you know what? You'll have like worldwide notoriety. People will, will come along to see that. Or, you know what, Jesus? You're hungry, right? You've been out here fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, hey, if you are the son of God, Satan says, the accuser of the brethren says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. How about that? You know what? The, the Judean landscape was just completely littered with stones. Big stones, little stones, in-between stones, stones the size of a loaf of bread, stones the size of a biscuit, stones shaped like a croissant. You know what? When you've been hungry and you've been out there in the wilderness starving for 40 days and 40 nights, I can imagine a lot of those stones would have reminded you of a loaf of bread. But here's what Jesus said. Do you remember what Jesus said to the adversary, what Jesus said to Satan? Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So when we, when we find that temptation, how did Jesus respond to temptation? First of all, Jesus quoted the scripture. Jesus quoted scripture back to the devil. The devil would say, if you are blah, 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 if you are the son of man, if you are all that. And Jesus responded consistently with scripture from, from Deuteronomy, right? So always understand, understand this, that Satan's not going to leave us alone. First of all, right? Now, James chapter 4, verse 7, you know, just jumping ahead in the book of James a little bit, it says, therefore, submit to God. And then he says this, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. What an idea, right? We don't have to entertain every temptation that comes our way. Now, pastors said this before. You can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. So when, when we're tempted, we need to recognize that temptation and then 
Resist the devil and watch the devil flee. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Here's what Paul says to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is verse 13. Paul writes, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So Jesus is telling us that whenever we encounter temptation, whenever we encounter temptation, God will always provide a means of escape. God will provide for us a way to escape that temptation being blossomed into sin and yielding the resulting death. So the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and he says, look, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of of the devil. You know what that word wiles means? It means that the devil is tricky. It means that the the devil is always thinking about how he can trip us up one way or another. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. Wow, this is a scripture heavy lesson we've got today, but but it's right on point. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 says be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So, you know what? Maybe your temptation is not Turkish delight. Maybe you don't have... Maybe, you know what? Maybe sweet stuff is not your temptation, culinarily. Maybe salty stuff is your temptation. Or maybe that umami, you know, a nice big T-bone steak is a temptation. But, but watch this. Learn the lesson from Edmund that there are things out there that if we're not careful, if we're not alert, if we're not vigilant against them, they can be snares to us and they can actually pull us down. So no matter what it is that is your favorite, uh, Jesus says, look, what profit do you have? What do you gain? If you gain the entire world, but you lose your soul, you've not gained anything, right? What profiteth a man who gains the entire world, but loses his soul? I got to tell you what, friends, your soul is worth so much more than all the Turkish delight in Istanbul. Or is it Constantinople? We'll look that up. But, But your soul is worth so much more than the paltry sums that we sell out for. How do you know? Please, please, please. How do you know that if you didn't just hold on for a little bit longer, that God would have provided that escape for temptation, that you would have not fallen into the sin and the resulting death that comes from that, right? So so always be on guard. Be aware. Be alert. You know, there's a principle that I'm afraid is becoming increasingly rare in our, our 21st century world. It's the principle of situational awareness. You know what? When when you're traveling through the neighborhood, when you're doing things, you know, it's a good thing to be situationally aware. Look around. See who's there. Pay attention to, you know, sounds that might be out of place, people that might be out of place. Be situationally aware. But so often, I want to live life with my earbuds in. I want to live life scrolling on my phone, and and I'm missing all these things. To be spiritually situationally aware is important as well. Where does God have me right now? Am I getting closer to God or am I moving further away from God? 
We've got poor little Edmund. And Edmund is basically selling out himself and his entire family for a little dish of Turkish delight. But you know what? He's not alone. Because whenever we sell out, hear me, we sell out cheap. Whenever we sell out to sin, Satan, the adversary, we always sell out cheap. How can I say that? Look at Judas. Judas sold out. Oh, wait a minute. You think Judas sold out Jesus. What really happened was that Judas sold out himself. And what did he sell it for? Sold it for 30 pieces of silver. You know what? There's some economists out there, and these economists have, have done the calculations. They've done the work. They sat down and they said, okay, silver costs this much an ounce. 30 pieces of silver weighs about this much. What was the dollar value that Judas sold out Jesus for? You know what it comes out to? Oh, are you thinking millions? No. Are you thinking hundreds of thousands? No. Judas sold out Jesus for something on the order of just about 150 bucks. 150 bucks. Now, what did I say? Judas didn't sell out Jesus as much as Judas sold out himself. Sold out himself for 150 bucks. Jesus says, look, you're, you, you are worth so much more than that. By the way, in, in the, the mathematics that was used back in Jesus' day, most of the mathematics was based on a, a, a system of base 60, right? Because our, our time today, we have 60 minutes in an hour in a, in a circle, there's 360 degrees. Everything in Sumerian culture was based on a, a mathematics system, base 60, and it persists to this day. In Jesus' day, when somebody would have said something was 30 pieces of silver, what that meant was, well, hey, 30 is half of 60. 60 would have been a complete whole, right? So 30 is half of that. In the, in the common language of Jesus' day, to say that something sold for 30 pieces of silver was basically saying it was worthless. It, it, it wasn't worth much. And so Judas, selling out Jesus, actually put the price tag on his own soul. And the price tag that he put on it, not very much at all. Remember Jacob and Esau with, with the birthright. We've got Esau selling his birthright for a little bowl of soup, a bowl of bean soup. Not much at all, but Esau despised his birthright said, well, you know, my, my relationship to my family is not worth that much. What would God have had in store for any and each of us if we would have embraced the true value of things? So, when we think of uh, Turkish delight, I want to always remember that that Turkish delight is representing temptation. It's, it's a representation of that which would pull us away from following Jesus Christ. The rich young ruler had some blinders on. You know, he, he could not do what it was that Christ offered him to do. He decided he would rather stick with his, his money, stick with his fame, stick with his youth, and have all of those things rather than the kingdom of God. Friends, you are worth so much more than whatever it is Satan is using to try to tempt you away. And you know what? Comes a day when the things of this world, all of the, the, the Turkish delights, we realize that they're sweet on the tongue for a minute, but when they're gone, they're gone, right? And so what Christ is offering us is eternal, and it's in the heavens. So, Next time we're thinking about, uh, you know, something sweet, something delightful. You know what? Okay, let's take the allegory aside. Turkish delight, expensive, 
exotic, very tasty. It's the kind of thing that, you know what? If you get a chance to pick some up sometime, go ahead and give it a try. And as you do, recognize that Christ died for me. Christ sees my soul as the most valuable thing that has ever been created. And so follow Jesus. Follow Jesus eagerly. Follow Jesus willingly. Follow Jesus with a celebration in your heart. Well, from Taste and See and from SSC Live TV, this is Ken Jobst. It has been a delight to be with you. Please tune in once again as we continue to walk down that intersection of faith and food that is Taste and See. From all our friends at SSC Live TV, we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.